I would say it is very common for the calligraphers that I know of to earn six figures for, for, for their weddings. So you want to be a wedding invite designer and stationer, but do you know everything that goes into that? There's a lot more than you think, and this week's episode, I'm talking to Carla Lim of Written Word Calligraphy, who has been doing this for a very long time, and is a really fun person to talk to to try and get some of the insider scoop and all of the honest information about what it's like to be a successful wedding invite designer and calligrapher. So uh, lots of tips coming your way, and I think we should just jump right in. Carla, welcome to the show. Oh, hi, Becca. So nice to finally do this. You're like, oh, hi, I didn't know, I didn't see you there. I, yeah. <laughs> I Okay, so I have known about you and your business for a long time because you were in the Modern Calligraphy Summit, right? Like a long yes. time ago. <laughs> yes, and, it seems like a long time ago. Well, at the, but at the same time, it feels like yesterday. And then when I was thinking about it, I was like, wait, that was a really long time ago. Like, yeah. that was a thing. That was a big thing when uh, I was probably in like year one of doing calligraphy and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how long have you been doing calligraphy for then if you were like enough of an expert to teach? Back then? <laughs> I, I have been doing calligraphy about nine years now. Um, but I have been doing it as a business officially around seven years. Okay. Yeah. So I, you know, kind of had that time, you know, I mean, when I was watching your videos early on as well, I was like, Oh, your experience at Michael's was exactly like mine. You know, it's like, Oh, I don't know. Maybe this would work. Maybe this would work. Pick up and the like, calligraphy pen and it has nothing to do with what we need. Yeah, exactly. And um, I even picked up a fountain pen at, at Michael's and like t tried it out. And especially because I was a lot more focused on the pointed pen calligraphy. So, we, you know, with the brushes and all that stuff, Michael's is, is great for it. But w with regard to like pointed pen, it was not the, yeah. not the place for it. It's still not. It's still not. No. <laughs> um, okay. Before we like just jump in and start talking, I do want you to give like for anybody who didn't see the modern calligraphy summit or like isn't already following you somehow can you give us a little rundown of who you are what you do and all that good stuff yeah absolutely so hi everyone my name is Carla and my business is called written word calligraphy I'm from Vancouver Canada and I um, I specialize a lot in wedding invitations so a lot of uh, my clients are usually all over the world um, I've been so um, honored to, to work with a lot of people like in Italy and in Hong Kong and wherever else. I wish they would hire me and bring me there for their weddings. <laughs> um, and earlier this year, I, I also started to do like online courses as well. And that was um, a really fun thing because I, I obviously I also do teach like in-person workshops, but this year in-person workshops are not happening. <laughs> and so that's kind of uh, what I've been doing lately. Um, yeah. Okay, and you left out that you wrote a book. Oh, yes. <laughs> 2020 was the year of the book. Um, so like writing the book and um, producing the book, photographing the book and, you know, planning and all that fun stuff. So we're super excited that it's finally launching on December 8th. And so if you guys are interested in finding out some, uh, well, getting a book that has a little bit of like beginner stuff as well as like crafting things related to, you know, possibly your wedding or get creating gifts uh, for friends. That's the book. Love it. Okay. Well, I'll definitely link to it um, down below, but you, so your business is like hugely reliant on weddings and doing wedding yes. stationery and stuff like that and so when we decided to have you come on the show we were trying to figure out like okay what can we have her come on and talk about it? and I remember thinking like Carla will be honest and like just like a fun person to have a candid conversation <laughs> with about what it's actually like to be a stationer and specifically for weddings and stuff because I think and I know this because I did the same thing when I first started learning calligraphy I was like oh I'm gonna like specialize in wedding calligraphy and it'll just be like this glamorous amazing job and I'll love every day of my life and, it'll just be <laughs> and I think a lot of people you know get into calligraphy and think the same thing but I know that there is so much more that goes into all of it and like I just wanted to have a fun candid conversation where you kind of hit us with like 
things you should actually know about being a wedding stationer and just, you know, the honest, the honest side of things. The other so, side. <laughs> yeah. So if you're cool with that, I think um, we should, I'm just going to like let you hit us with some different points. And then as you say things, I'll jump in and we can like have a fun conversation about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would say um, there, here, I'm going to share like five little things that are like the real talk about being a wedding stationer. But don't get me wrong. I do love my job. I am still a wedding stationer after all of these years. And I, I, I mean, I really do enjoy the process of creating it. But there's definitely a lot of things happening with the whole like wedding invitation world. Um, I mean, personally for myself, I've blessed that before I became a calligrapher, I was also a photographer, I did video, I, um, I also did graphic design. So I had a lot of this background knowledge already um, before I became, before I learned calligraphy. So becoming a wedding invitation designer, first and foremost, is, the, is really not only about knowing how to do calligraphy. Like you need to know a lot of these other elements as well to kind of make it happen. So it's, um, it's almost like a, it's a perfect job for a jack of all trades type of person because now you kind of need to know a little bit of everything and put it all together. Uh, because yeah, the fact is that there are other skills required um, because most of the time, like uh, in the wedding in invitation um, experience, at least the, the customer, your client, the people who are getting married, they also don't really know anything about the whole wedding invitation thing. They're, they're hoping that you'd be the one to answer those questions for them. So if they come to you and you're, you'll say that, oh, I only do like the calligraphy part, but you don't do the design or you don't know how to print it, then they'll be like, then who do I go? Who do I call? Um, and personally for myself, maybe it's just the way I work. I also like to be involved in the entire process. Um, I know there are some calligraphers that don't deal with printing at all, um, but I would be scared <laughs> with um, how the printer is going to deal with my artwork and all that stuff and not knowing the right colors and, the whole client experience just seems really daunting. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so I've talked about this in the past where like if a client comes to me and wants me to write their names for their wedding invites or whatever, yep. like I'll tell them I can write those names and calligraphy for you, but then I'm going to pass it off to your graphic designer who is creating your invite suite because I don't know enough about all of that stuff to pull that off properly for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it would be really nice for, uh, a client to come to somebody who knows how to do all of it and can just have it all done in one place. So, I mean, yeah, that's, so if you had to name like on top of knowing calligraphy, three other like super important skills that you would say you use on an everyday or weekly basis, what would they be? It, it would definitely, you know, knowing how to use your Photoshop and illustrator because the design process revolves around that like scanning your work and getting it digitized and get, putting it on putting it together on illustrator mm -hmm. and then i actually pull it back into photoshop when i create the mock-ups for the client and that way they can visually see most people are visual people like they really won't be able to get everything from a pencil sketch um so they really want to see the colors of how everything is tying together so definitely in terms of like a program thing that's one those two things for sure and then having the knowledge about printing of what's possible and what's not because you know it <laughs> people go on pinterest and everyone's got these bright ideas i i want my invitation on a rock or like a piece of <laughs> a piece of wood or like is this mailable you know like having all that knowledge of like is this feasible you know um so for sure that those are my top three things and of course there's all the other things like you know knowing how to take photos of your work and all that stuff because marketing is so important <laughs> and these are things like on top of just knowing how to run a business in the first place which is like its own exactly. battle but that goes for anybody you know doing something like this not necessarily just stationary but like being a calligrapher in general you sort of have to learn the business side of things too so absolutely because 
most of the time, like 90% of the time, we're not writing. We have to <laughs> take photos of our work, do, yeah. talk with our clients and, um, you know, create mock-ups and stuff like that. Like in my day, my normal day, I, I'm not um, writing envelopes all day. You know, that's maybe like one out of like one day in like two weeks or two, two days in two weeks type of thing, you know? Which is so good for people to know because like I said, I think when you think about starting a stationary business, you're like, yeah, I just sit at my desk and I have my pretty inks out and I, and I write these pretty things all day and then I just, then I just check out at the end of the day. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and which is actually my second point about like, you know, real thing, real talk about like being a wedding stationer is that you really, when you're pricing things out, it's not just like yeah. the hourly rate of your physical, like calligraphy work. You have to take into consideration to set the time that you spend yeah. discussing with your clients that, you know, um, it's really not just like creative labor. It's, it's very different from like an, you know, an event calligraphy type of role where you are going there physically being there for an entire two hours and writing the entire mm -hmm. time. Um, of course, you also add that in there and also the possibility of making mistakes and all that stuff. Um, but there's also like the whole, okay, well, I needed to eat in order for a custom, you know, for example, a custom client, you, you may have had two or three meetings. That's the like three hours of your time. Mm -hmm. and scheduling those meetings involved, you know, responding to those emails, 15, 30 minutes of it. And if you don't consider that in your whole pricing package you're you're going to have a lot of hours on, on cold for right yeah no i think that's a really good point and i have a, a pricing course where we talk about stuff like that and and one of the things that i always notice when people first come into the course and don't know much about pricing is they just assume that you figure out what your hourly rate is and then you charge your hourly rate for the amount of hours you're sitting there writing your calligraphy yeah. like you just said that's like two days out of a week or even less than that so how do you make money the rest of the time you know yeah um, so it's, that's a really good point. I, I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that one up. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Because I think like a lot of us are so focused on say the amount per envelope, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's the reason why, you know, when you hire me to do envelopes, it's not $2 an envelope because, you know, it takes me a lot longer time to prepare even to write them. And then there's also a chance that you make a mistake um, in the process. Uh, so maybe if you are priced really low, you will get every day, you will have envelopes to write every day for an entire, for an entire week, but you probably won't get paid enough for it as well. Yeah, that and like, you'll notice after the first job that you priced yourself too low because you physically cannot sit there. And yeah. Often. I did that, I remember I did that, I took on someone's um, wedding and it was like 200 invites and I was like, yeah, yeah, I could do that this week. And it was, should have taken me way longer than I gave <laughs> myself time for. So I was sitting there like hours and hours and hours every day trying to get them all done. And I remember thinking, I'm not getting paid enough for this. Right yes. Like, man, you'll kick yourself if you do it. And actually it's also because um, I guess like it depends on what you have com in comparison to, right? I think in the wedding calligraphy world, sometimes if we say you focus only on like checking in on Etsy or something, it's different because um, maybe people devalue themselves as a calligrapher, whereas if you say compare it to a photographer, um, where it's also a service business, but their job is a more more of like a one day thing plus like um, a little bit of like the editing afterwards. The time and effort that they get paid for, sometimes you know they get paid like ten fifteen thousand for that one day of shooting. But we know that our job ta taking on the wedding invitations could have been a year of conversations prior to that right mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a lot more back and forth a lot more like client holding i think my third third tip is a little bit more um in the process of actually doing the design which is about um getting more than one set of eyes i mean i'm sure you've experienced that um where you <laughs> Okay, even just envelopes alone. I don't know how many times I've, you know, misspelled something or skipped a line and gone to the next person just because it's just we're human beings. We make mistakes. So you really need another set of really good eyes to go through them and then go through them another time. You can't, it's really hard. It's so easy to make a mistake or to just like glaze over 
typos, Mm -hmm. um, both for written things and printed materials. So like wedding invites themselves. Like I've had wedding planners sign off on the design and they come back in the print and there's two lines of the exact same line printed on the invite, you know? (laughs) But I I mean, at that point, if they've signed off on it, it's technically not your fault anymore. It is not technically. If it's something really blatant and you're like, yeah, I, that was super my mistake. Like that's something you should have caught yourself. Like, can, do you remember one single instance where it was like your biggest mess up with typos or like not proofreading properly? Cause I sure do, but I want to hear. Yeah. You. Well, that one was my most recent one. That one where the, the RSVP line had two dates because we were, we were going to give out like two batches of invitations for the client and what had happened was um, I had given them the, the two options, but I, I had forgotten to remove one of them, but then they had all signed off on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the invitations came, I took photos of the invitations. I sent it to them. I usually send them a, a, a sneak peek, right? Good thing that the wedding planner caught it before we sent it out because or else they would have two dates on that exact same reply card. So what happened in that instance? Did you like, you know, take the penalty and have to reprint them on your own dime or what happened? We actually, on this one, I, I did a split. Okay. I did a split with the, with the wedding planner because I, I also should have caught it. Um, and, and the fact was we were running short on time because uh, usually, you know, the invitations go out like about two months, two, three months before the wedding. And now with this mistake, we were going to be like another week late. And so we consolidated it into one date instead. So it's one of those instances where like, it's tough because when they sign their contract, it says in it, like once you sign off the proofs, it's no longer my problem. But at the same time, like you as a small business owner want to provide a good service and you don't want to upset your clients and stuff. And so that's like one of the trickier business scenarios. So it sounds like you had like a reasonable, nice client, but sometimes it doesn't turn out quite so. Yeah. Yeah. So I usually get my studio manager to double check that as well. And I, my, my printer is actually really keen on it as well. Most of the time, like they're the ones that tell me, Hey, Carla, like, you know, I think you're missing an end here or a two here. So having another set of eyes for sure. And I think like going back to that pricing part, um, if you had also buffered yourself a little bit, you might not lose out on it, right? Like, so typically whenever I'm pricing out my wedding invitations, I buffer for like, you know, the, ta- the shipping costs or some mistakes that way, just in case things like this happen, I'm not the one, I'm not shelling out money that I don't have. It's yeah. like within the range of whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because- that's a really good point. And at the same time, knowing to order yourself more than what you need to do like more envelopes more um cards and stuff because as a person writing physically writing you (laughs) are going to make mistakes it's inevitable yeah my next point is um about spending a lot more time in the marketing and promotion part than the designing (laughs) you know because a lot of the clients that you receive that you actually get for the right market that you're looking for are, is, is not going to just magically come out of nowhere. They usually personally come, at least for myself, from the wedding planners that I have worked with and have the similar client base. So a lot of my time, um, aside from designing and creating these invitations, are actually cultivating or creating new relationships with these people because I mean before when Instagram and Facebook wasn't so um, based on algorithm and stuff like people would find me on Instagram and hire me directly from there I still obviously have that experience where I have got like loyal followers been following me for a while love my work and want to hire me but a lot of times when you know someone is getting married their experience actually comes in from like start their starting point is either from people that other people know or wedding planners that hey I already have a dream team of people that I trust and I recommend for your style Um, because uh, I think like a lot of people um, you know focus on like okay I want to be an artist and just create 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 but most of the time it actually ends up becoming like no it's, it's a little bit of both and 
a lot of marketing to be honest <laughs> yeah I always talk about that that there's so many people who are brilliant artists but they don't have the like marketing hat that they can just put on and it's so important when you're a small business to be able to market yourself properly and I actually really love what you said about um, making relationships with other people in that industry and how usually a lot of wedding planners will have their dream team and so if yeah. you can market yourself and like create relationships with people and become part of one of those dream teams it's so invaluable yeah absolutely and so one of the ways that I actually do these like cultivation ones is first of all like reaching out to these people I, I'm like a DM or stalker or it seems like <laughs> I'm like hi you know I really love your work I'd love to send you a sample kit of my yeah. work yeah you know if I feel like their style connects with mine and that the but you know the weddings because I'm not gonna lie that I I don't I like the wedding budgets that I usually work with are not small so it like I'll need to work with wedding planners that work with those types of brides yeah. or else like I'll be they'll be wasting my time I'll be wasting theirs as well because they'll be asking me for quotes and they'll be like you're too expensive right like need to have, find like a good balance of that too and so sending them a really good kit of your work and samples and and just the whole experience because because of the fact I was telling you like a lot of my weddings are not local to me and so they, all these planners from all over the world would need to have something that they would need to be impressed in my work from, from afar and then be able to present that to the client and say, mm -hmm. this is Carla's work. And just from my work alone, they'd be able to see how it looks and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I love can that. Make it tangible. <laughs> and of course, uh, and lastly, I wanted to share was that I think it's really important to find a style yeah. that you are proud of and to stick with it because that's what people are looking for. I think like as a calligrapher, um, as a calligrapher invitation designer, if you come to people and they say that I can do anything, <laughs> it'll be really hard for them to understand what your style is. Even the color palette that you choose. For example, I very rarely use neon colors in my wedding invitations. And so, but, but it's absolutely fine. It's just not my style. And so, so whenever like a client comes to me and wants to work with these colors and I'm just like, I'm not certain if we are the right match for each other for like the style you're looking for, or I'm a modern calligrapher and someone wants to look for like a traditional calligraphy style from me. And I'm just like, I don't think we'll be a right match. I've actually had um, clients before where we've fallen off or we, we just never went through because after, even though they love my work and after, but after talking through them in the meeting, I discovered that, you know, the kind, the kind of calligraphy styles they're looking for are not something I can do. Um, not just because, you know, it's not just because I can't do them. It's just that it's not the work that I'd be, I'd want to show and add mm -hmm. to my portfolio. It's similar to like, say a photographer that is focused on say like editorial, you're, you're shooting a lot of like businesses, for example, and all of a sudden you're being asked to do a family photo shoot. Um, maybe not your strength if you're not used to dealing with kids and people mm -hmm. so it's kind of like that same element to it yeah and i think um it, it comes down to a lot of like the average person who is just getting married and trying to line up all these vendors knows nothing about different calligraphy styles they're like oh calligraphy no, is yeah. calligraphy yeah but you you as the calligrapher need to know like where exactly where your strengths lie mm -hmm. like i could work a pointed pen in a way that will probably get me something that looks sort of like copper plate if that's what you really want yeah but it's not going to be as good as if i sent it to an actual calligrapher who does copper plate like it's it, yeah. it just doesn't make sense for me to try and take that on and then not want to showcase it because i don't want to do that for anyone else you know that makes a lot of sense like i'm yeah i'm glad you brought that one up because i think the temptation for a lot of brand new calligraphers too is to just take on everything because they yeah. aren't getting many clients Exactly. Mm -hmm. And for example, when I was starting out, I also did a lot of like in person, uh, I mean, um, like day of details. But after a while, it was getting really difficult. And then so because of the, I don't know, maybe because if it's local, everyone's always last minute, last minute changes. Um, whereas, um, like, and, and eventually, I ended up like kind of phasing myself out of, uh, out of like, doing a lot of the, the the local day of details because of the fact that it just wasn't the right fit for me mm -hmm. you know so I kind of 
it's important to to also choose to do what your heart what you're happy and you're at peace with and do great in what you can do because it will it will come out okay because i think a lot of us like you said are scared especially at the beginning because you feel like okay i need to do everything um because i need the money <laughs> or i want to become like the most reliable clicker forever yeah Obviously, it's not going to work out in the long term because everyone will take advantage of you. <laughs> I think it's funny that you uh, you started phasing out the day of details, and I started phasing out the stationery. <laughs> yeah, started only doing like that's just proof right there that both you and I figured out what our strengths were and decided to like stop doing one or the other. So it's not yeah. to say like when you're first starting out that you should turn down things just because they're not exactly what you want. Like, I think it is good to experiment and take yeah. on a bunch of stuff so that you can understand what you do and don't like. But uh, if it's something like totally out of your realm, maybe like give it a second thought. <laughs> yeah. And then, and be open about that to your client, right? Because the transparency will help them. Um, because yeah, like for example, if it is really is not your style, forcing yourself to, to do it or is, is not going to, come up with the work that they're satisfied with or you're satisfied with and mm -hmm. it just like makes like a really weird interaction as well it's like uh, i'm really not sure about that c copper plate style that you make <laughs> yeah okay carla since we're being like totally candid here i have a question for you yes um that you can choose to answer or not but my question is like because i actually don't know the answer to this question if for someone who does full-time wedding stationery like you do and i'm not asking you to tell me your salary but like what it would be if someone is starting out in that industry and they want to like have a, a goal for themselves to build a business that's going to make like an average amount of money that somebody in that industry makes do you have something in your mind that's like the standard for somebody doing that full-time hmm, i am not sure I would think that it should be, it should be a really good business because yeah. like people are getting married all the time. So even though my weddings have all, have mostly been postponed that there's still like smaller weddings and, and things like that. So I would say, I would say it is very common for the calligraphers that I know of to earn six figures for, for, for their weddings, for, yeah. for being a wedding stationer. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good goal to have um, as a wedding stationer without killing yourself in the process. <laughs> um, because obviously the thing about wedding stationery that is hard as well is the fact that each client has an end, right? Typically people spend station on stationery the most only on their wedding day. Like people won't be spending that same amount of money on their, on their kids' birthdays or their birthday parties afterwards. I mean, there are some people that do that, yes, but not very often. But usually wedding invites are the highest. And so um, with that being so finite uh, that, you know, you can only, your client like kind of starts and ends at a certain point. Um, and you can only do so many weddings in a year. Like you really don't want to get 100 weddings, which I've done. Um, you just... <laughs> You're just really, really tired at the end of the year. <laughs> um, but, and it's also because I think like for the most part, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging type of role to, to impart to someone else. So I, I did have a studio manager, so she managed a lot of my semi-custom suites. Um, that way I could focus on the custom invitations. Uh, and then so I was doing like the spot calligraphy and then she would do like the graphic design. So that part is good. But um, my focus was on the custom invites and those ones, you know, we'd source out some weird things. And I mean, like more unique things like, you know, velvet and um, linen folios and like boxes for invitations, wine, wine boxes for invitations, those things like a lot more like specialty. And so they're harder to like just pass off to someone mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sorry, my very long winded answer there. <laughs> No, it's a good answer. Um, and I have one more question that might seem like weird to people listening, but I don't think it'll seem weird to you because I'm sure you've heard of it before and <laughs> maybe you even have it. But I was going to ask you, do you have insurance on your hand? Oh, I don't. <laughs> do you? No, no. But I remember hearing, like, I don't think I've heard of many people having it, but I remember hearing like years and years and years ago that Laura Hooper had uh insurance on her hand because she did so many like that was her bread and butter was doing invites 
Yeah, we probably should. We probably should get it. <laughs> I'm just I'm willing to have to pay for one more, one more thing. No, just kidding. Um, I mean, I have all sorts of insurances, but not specifically on my hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. But see, that's the thing, right? Like, I think eventually we'll come to a point where, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll get really old and that we won't be able to write as great. Um, I, I laugh about this because every time, every now and then, that, you know, we talk about our access to our courses. And can you imagine what later on, we're like in the nursing home and super old and people still asking us about like how to hold a pen. <laughs> Or, yeah, like, like, will I have, will I have access to this course forever? And you're like, yes, forever. yes, yeah. forever. But you, can, you know, you like, I'm 90 talking. years. Yeah, like you'll see a video of me at this age, but in like 20 years when I don't look quite this fresh anymore. <laughs> oh, I was thinking like 50 years okay, down the road type of thing. I was like, okay, <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure about what I would be like at that age, but yeah. Um, Things will change, right? I mean, your style has changed over time, and and, and that, that's like I think that's the beauty of 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 it being handwritten, and mm -hmm. that's like the type of things I explain to my client. I do have a clause on my like on my invitation on my contract. Sorry, not on my invitations. That'd be weird. Um, to, that that speaks about like if I was suddenly unable to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Like what what happens, and like how, how much I'm. I will pay back because it's similar to things that, you know, wedding cancellations, because that's essentially what's happening right now, right? With the whole COVID situation, um, I have a lot of weddings that were repostponed to about March, April next year, and they're all like in the verge of repostponing. And I don't know how, how much people have flexibility for, for postponing because I, some people can't wait, right? Like, and so they end up either eloping um, or having a much smaller wedding, which obviously affects the our final invoice or like the amount that we were supposed to pay. So like all of this like more technical stuff definitely has to go into your contract talking about cancellations. But I think the most important part, especially with this whole COVID situation, is to just make sure you get paid for the work you've done. Um, because I think it's 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 more important to be fair right now then it is to be like, okay, I'm going to fight for my rights to get paid the entire amount because obviously there is like a real like pandemic. It's like a real like issue around the world. Right. It, I, at least that's how I feel. I'm okay. Yeah, no, I agree. I think <laughs> so many people in the wedding industry are struggling with that kind of thing too. And, and every situation is different, obviously mm -hmm. too, but I think definitely this is like a uh, how many points did you do? Five. So this is like a 5.5 or a six. Yeah. <laughs> just like, I think moving forward, everyone's going to have like a pandemic clause in their contract for sure. Yeah, I know. Right. Because it's important because you, you just don't know when like forces of nature like this, you know, changes the whole world, changes yeah. the whole situation. Like even paper has issues getting shipped. Um, and, and paper has gone up in prices as well because the paper mills got closed and like the s demand went down and um, some of the some of the envelope companies are shut down right now. It's crazy. Do you know the envelopment company? Yeah, and that, I guess that was the whole theme of this conversation was like the real side of things that you don't anticipate. I mean, it is still r worth it. You know, like these are types of things that once you kind of get a, a hang of it, like you'll learn with every experience, right? Yeah. And and that. And those types of experiences like help you as an invitation designer or as a, as a calligrapher to be stronger because without like these fail like little things like the stories I've told about making these mistakes like I probably wouldn't have those clauses on my um, on my contract or I wouldn't know how to deal with that client when there is something that happens. Totally, and it's I mean it's inevitable to anybody that these things are going to happen to all these weird situations. But I feel like conversations like this one set people up for a more realistic expectation. So <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Carla, for coming on and oh. being honest about all this stuff with us. Um, yeah. Where can people find you and learn more about you, or maybe even there's people watching who are getting married and want you to do their invites? Because uh, oh, yeah. we already <laughs> talked about we already talked about where we can get your book, right? Or did we not? Yeah, there, well, the link is just on my website. There's a lot of the pre-order links currently, but obviously by um, by the time we have this, it'll be available December 8th. But yeah, super excited about that. The book also has a lot of like DIY things for like weddings. There's a section on weddings and events and also like gifts of what you can give 
for like wedding favors. So if you want, you guys want to find me, I'm pretty active on Instagram, um, written word calligraphy. And yeah, I'm usually on there on like IG uh, stories. Okay. Well, Carla, it was so nice to talk to you and get all of your honest, uh, your honest wisdom. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.